Hello. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone listening in. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to day four of the ICC International Trade and Prosperity Week. Uh, this session is going to look at the human rights, the role of human rights in global value chains and, and the role of human rights in resetting the global economy, uh, with a specific look at the review of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, this is a pre-recorded session, so please use the live discussion chat room. Uh, we will be in that chat room uh, having a conversation around the content of the panel, so please do engage with us there. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors for this particular session and the conference overall. I'd like to just introduce you to Crispin Conroy, uh, the ICC representative to the United Nations in Geneva, who's going to open up with some, some overall remarks on the agenda, and then we'll break into the panel discussion with Dante Pesce. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. First of all, let me thank the hosts of this event, ICC UK, uh, and of course the sponsors, and to congratulate you, Chris, and the team uh, for your leadership on the important uh, issue of business and human rights, as well as on the international trade agenda. And also, of course, for this, this week, the International Trade and Prosperity Week. 10 years ago, something very important took place. States, businesses, and civil right, civil society came together to develop an internationally agreed framework on business and human rights, the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, or UNGPs that you've just mentioned, Chris. This is a framework enshrining states' obligations to protect human rights, corporate responsibilities to respect human rights, and the need for appropriate and effective remedies when those rights are breached. Over the past decade, ICC has actively supported its members to scale up business implementation of the UNGPs. And I have to say that ICC UK has been at the forefront of the efforts within the ICC network. ICC has also promoted a greater implementation by governments by calling for the development of robust national action plans and more work needs to be done here. The UNGPs are a game changer and we should recognize this. They created a space for us in the private sector to deepen our collaboration with the major stakeholders, such as states, trade unions, civil society organizations, and of course, the UN system. But we must also recognize that more needs to be done in the decade ahead, that all stakeholders, including businesses, must be involved in new policy and regulatory developments. Let me recognize here the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights in this regard, through Dante Pesce, the former chair, who is moderating the panel today. ICC has been actively engaging with the working group, including through a UK-led uh, consultation, which again, thanks Chris for your, you and your team for initiating. And ICC has also established in recent months an informal ICC working group on business and human rights to bring together companies from our network to discuss recent policy and legal developments and to share experiences and concerns. If any of the participants here today are interested in learning more about the, the, the ICC Working Group, please do not hesitate to contact me through, through Chris and his team. The UNGPs refer clearly to the need for a mix of measures, both voluntary initiatives and regulatory frameworks to ensure implementation by states and by business. It now seems clear that the main focus internationally and in individual jurisdictions is on developing additional measures to further the implementation of the UNGPs through a so-called smart mix of measures, including mandatory measures on human rights due diligence. This is reflected in a steady, a steady uh, spread of a patchwork of mandatory measures or a smart mix of mandatory and voluntary measures in a number of jurisdictions. This patchwork of measures has the potential to create increasing uncertainty for business and risks creating an uneven playing field for operations. A number of leading businesses and business sectoral coalitions are actively supporting some sort of mandatory due diligence measures with the objective that such measures would promote greater consistency and a level playing field. However, many others, including SMEs, have concerns, such as the burden of additional regulatory requirements and the extent of liability. Greater business engagement in shaping future legislative measures, in sharing global best practice, and in providing support for SMEs is required. 
in order to accelerate implementation of the UNGPs, an internationally consistent next generation smart mix of implementation measures must deliver multi-stakeholder policy coherence and a level playing, playing field for all companies. And these measures must result in a real impact on the ground for individuals. Looking to the second decade of the UNGPs, we must place an absolute focus on policy interventions that make uh, an immediate difference in the real world, especially for those most vulnerable. This will require a variety of initial initiatives at different levels, underpinned by true openness and collaboration between business governments and civil society. Here, there is a real opportunity for ICC in the spirit of our centenary declaration and through event, events like this today to lead the transformation process in collaboration with other stakeholders and to develop the healthy and transparent policy frameworks required to address, address these challenges and to find solutions. And in this context, let me reiterate our support for the efforts of the UN Working Group and our intention to engage closely with them and other stakeholders on their roadmap for the future, which will be, re be released later this month. ICC commits to maintaining its leadership role in developing and promoting the urgent advances that are required to implement more effectively the UNGPs in the next decade, including, as I mentioned before, through events like this one today, where business perspectives can be shared and key issues can be discussed with policymakers. Thank you again, Chris, for inviting me today. And let me now pass back to you to introduce the panel. Thank you. Many thanks, Crispin. Um, as I hope you can all appreciate, this is an incredibly important agenda and a very topical agenda in, in many, many countries around the world. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dante Pesce, uh, who is uh, a member and former chair of the UN drafting group. So we really couldn't have anyone uh, more appropriate and better uh, to kind of guide us through this agenda with a terrific panel. So I'll hand over to Dante now to introduce the panel uh, and have the discussion. Thanks, Dante. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the invitation to Berlin and ICC UK. Greetings from Santiago, Chile, where I am from and where I am right now. Um, we will have a, a conversation about something uh, critical that, um, that Crispin just said, uh, which is the next decade of implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights. We went through uh, a detailed analysis, uh, 220 submissions, uh, 70 consultations, and a number, a number of bilaterals and, and engagements to basically come to a simple conclusion. The next decade, it is possible to raise the ambition. During the next decade, we need to deliver better, we need to deliver faster, we need to deliver deeper, we need to deliver more. And regarding the implementation of the guiding principles. And that is exactly what we need to discuss in, in terms of the future, a future of implementation with greater effectiveness a future where we discuss uh, the difficult conversations and, and move from the margins and move from pioneers to mainstreaming and normalizing. Uh, we will have right now a conversation about that, uh, the, pra the practicality. And we will have a conversation with three uh, corporate members from Walmart, Vodafone and Unilever that will describe to us and we will engage with them in, in questions and answers, but mostly around the practicality, the real, in, uh, the real hands-on implementation of this agenda. Um, then we will have a conversation with uh, a, a legal firm advisor, uh, De Bevois and Plimpton. And, and finally, Phil Bloomer uh, will drive us from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, will drive us about around challenges. And I hope he will challenge actually all the panelists uh, to get deeper uh, around the, the practical experience of implementing with effectiveness. So without further ado, I will go immediately into our first uh, speaker, uh, which is Moira Thompson from Vodafone. Um, and I will kick to you uh, one immediate question, um, which is uh, what are the big issues for the tech sector as we look ahead uh, in the implementation of the guiding principles? Uh, the value chain due diligence and challenges and effective due diligence uh, on downstream or upstream in your industry, mostly downstream, I'll say, uh, and, the, and the challenges of effectiveness. 
Uh, can you uh, drive us through, please, uh, Moira? The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Dante, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I think UNGPs have been brilliant so far in setting you know, the normative expectation for the standard of conduct for companies globally. Um, and I think you know, what's really interesting about them is that they have changed that perception, um, at least we're seeing this in the tech sector, of needing to look all the way through the value chain at your impacts on human rights. I think perhaps in the past, there's been more of a focus on supply chain. And of course, this still continues to be an issue in terms of sourcing of minerals in particular for technology products. But I think um, you know, the, the sector as a whole is now turning to thinking much more about the use of tech products and where the harms might occur there. And I think this is, you know, this end-to-end -end thinking, I think, is particularly um, new and, and challenging. Um, and um, you know, I think the WEF, WEF put out a report not that long ago thinking about this in much more detail. Of, of, of thinking all the way through from product design through to product use and product deployment. So that's where I think that sort of really key changes. But I think, you know, we'll also start to see this really come into focus with um, artificial intelligence, due diligence, uh, human rights due diligence. I think there are some particular challenges in that respect around understanding how the technology itself might impact people's rights, whether that's through the data set that it uses, whether or not you know, there are inherent discriminations built into that data, um, and then indeed through, through the use of that. And we're seeing you know, a lot of debate on this, um, around, particularly around the issue of facial recognition technology and the challenges there. And can you elaborate a little bit more on the, the need for collaboration with others? within your industry, but also uh, with the regulators, because you, you certainly need, you will not solve all problems alone, and you will yeah. necessarily need a level playing field where to operate and will, where to, um, say, confront the difficulties and the challenges that you face. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what's going on in that front? Yeah, sure. So um, collaboration is absolutely key, you're right. And um, Crispin talked very eloquently about the role that the ICC has played so far in this. I think, you know, particularly whilst the UNGPs have been in the state of what one might call soft law, and I know Samantha is probably going to address this a bit later on, I think, you know, often Often implementing the UNGPs is around, you know, very specific circumstances um, or examples in your sector, and that's really where it can be incredibly helpful getting together with others in your sector to talk through challenges and to try and create some kind of normative standard. I think, um, you know, there was a reference earlier to the sort of patchwork of measures, and I think that is um, possibly a concern because I think when you have a patchwork, then maybe you have gaps, and I think understanding um, you know, sector specific um, challenges is really, really important to address some of those gaps. And I think this is also where um, business and um, regulators can really work together to make sure that those gaps are, are covered and that, um, you know, that I think what we need is really a risk-based um, implementation if it is through hard law. And so understanding, you know, where are the higher areas of risk um, is really going to be critical. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. We will come back to the to uh, another round of, of the practicality of integration uh, into, your, into your business model and into your operations. But for the time being, thank you very much for, by also helping us setting the scene for this conversation. I, I will move to Tom Smith, uh, Director for uh, Global Government Affairs of Walmart, um, with a, a, a slightly the, the little change in the order of the questions that we have been discussing before, um, but, but is um, what are the challenges to Walmart's core work on human rights? So what's your position and what are you facing in reality? And if you can get into the discussion of mandatory human rights due diligence that is actually taking place right now in Europe and, and perhaps combining those two uh, questions, your state of play and the regulatory framework that is coming from the perspective of, of Walmart. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Dante, and thanks, thanks um, ICC for hosting it. It's um, a, a, a very relevant and useful um, panel. So um, great, great to, to to spend some time with everyone. Yeah. Okay. So to, I mean, the the, the challenges piece. Um, 
um there's, there's plenty of them let's just start with that as a kind of opening on there and, and i think they continue to be uh you know such a broad topic but i think it's often the the, the human rights risks are, 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 are complex and are often the result of these uh systematic issues that are deeply entrenched in economic practices workers lacking knowledge uh support or tools uh, to safeguard these rights being inconsistent government regulations being varied, varied enforcement um, across countries. And I think these, the, <clears throat> these factors make it very challenging for any um, single organization, even at our size, to have an impact. And I think particularly, obviously, the, the, the breadth and scale of the, of the products we sell and, and, and purchase across the globe, you know, we, 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 it's, it's a, a broad challenge. I think so. Some some specific ones on this. I think for certain practices, um, there's no universal set of specific uh, standards for responsible or sustainable production. I mean, we're talking about in the, in the details here, um, or certification that goes beyond that um, compliance with the law. So the example on this that that we've worked quite a bit on is around responsible recruitment. So you know that that can be one sort of challenge we found, and I think certainly back to some of the points that, that were talked through before, where a lot of business and, and trade associations and groups can play a role in helping to, 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 to drive a best practice on that. Um, I think secondly on that, human rights are often a upstream and beyond the reach of traditional kind of retailer oversight like ourselves, or all the sort of traditional monitoring tools. Example of this being around reliable data on the kind of source origin of certain commodities and product ingredients and the way in which they're produced. Um, as well as the blending and commoditization of, of, of products and um, ingredients, it makes it a complicating factor. There's some fantastic technology kind of getting developed. And again, that's a challenge and, and a solution around uh, transparency and traceability. You know, we, we've all, I'm sure, heard of some of the solutions around blockchain, you know, and this can really help that challenge. But, you know, adoption takes time. Um, and, you know, I think we should all encourage kind of future innovation in this space, because I think that's a that's a, uh, you know, a, a real potential solution to some of these big challenges. And I think lastly, it goes, it goes without saying that sort of pandemics, weather related events, political social unrest um, can create this huge amount of supply chain, uh, you know, supply and demand volatility that can interrupt supply chains that we've obviously, you know, um, had significant challenges with the past couple of years. So, um, yeah, plenty of things to do, Dante, on that, on, on the challenges. But I think, you know, there's some really interesting things out there for, for how to overcome some of these things. Um, yeah, OK, so on 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 the kind of legislation specifically, um, and I think firstly, you know, for us, just to clarify, we don't we don't we're not a business entity um, within Europe. So we kind of set a little bit kind of distance from from some of the European legislation, but obviously follow it with great interest. And I think. For, for the context and history um, of our former UK business, Asda, that, that was sold beginning of the year, was um, was involved in the development of one of the early stages of, of these types of legislation. So the UK uh, Modern Slavery Act, which we supported at the time and we were kind of heavily involved in providing business input, which was critical in, in it, it being developed. Um, and businesses like Asda and others are, are still kind of working with the governments to develop. We're also very close, it goes without saying, with uh, in the US, the Section 307 of the US Tariff Act, uh, which, for those not familiar, prohibits the importation of products made by forced or indentured labor. So in, in some instances, US customs may issue um, withhold and release orders, the WROs, to shipments of merchant, uh, merchandise believed to be made with forced labor. So we're following that piece closely that whilst often the debate isn't looking at isn't necessarily discussed as mandatory human rights in the states it's obviously the mechanisms are pretty similar to what the, the europeans have been discussing so you know I and mean, i think this is a common point throughout these you know we're keen for there to be a level playing field for businesses um around uh, around human rights in the supply chain and continuously encourage governments to align with un guiding principles um it there's no question that the framework has created clarity and resulted in a much more kind of focused approach in the promotion of, of human rights, but, you know, obviously st still much to do. I think, uh, you know, and, and certainly echo the other speakers, I'm sure we'll hear it throughout this around the harmonizations of standards and from a practical business point of view, fragmentation, you know, it, it can be, can be very challenging. Um, I think some other points on this Dante as well, that, that we've spoken about is I think, um, I think there's also real importance to focus on the end goal as well of what 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 are we trying to actually achieve out of the legislation and i think sometimes that you know can get missed in conversations around improving the lives of people in the supply chain um and i think 
you know, we know a lot of these uh, due diligence laws are, are a relatively recent phenomenon, and in some cases not, not even in place yet. So we kind of just need to be careful of, of understanding that kind of long-term plan on it. And, and so um, we certainly um, encourage there to be a smart mix of complementary measures. I think a lot of the business community are kind of behind that and really encourage the development of looking at other tools such as trade policies, trade agreements, export credit, direct lending, um, finance, you know, discussion with finance institutions, public sector procurement initiatives. So there's a bunch of that, a, a, a piece on this. And I think we kind of want to encourage legislators to create policies that's practical. And I think key, um, which, you know, happy to discuss is to, for the legislation not to have this potential unintended consequences of, of companies just stopping to source from certain markets, because obviously that, that, that wouldn't be back to, the, again, the point of this legislation wouldn't be improving the lives of workers in the supply chain. Um, and then just finally on this, Chris, I think the other point, uh, uh, sorry, Dante, which, which Crispin brought up as well, is this encouraging open constructive dialogue with all different stakeholders. You know, this is still, you know, new things to, to many people in the supply chain and, 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 and different uh, stakeholders. So for these policies to be effective in the long term, all stakeholders need to be brought along in the journey. And, you know, that can be a challenging thing, but it's absolutely critical, um, you know, be it business or NGOs or community groups. I, I think this is a, a really uh, essential piece in how these legislations evolve. I'll pause there, Dante. Dante hopefully that answers it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. And, and, and many of the elements that you're flagging in terms of the challenges requires uh, collaboration in the pre-competitive space for business. Uh, also, Moira was touching on this point, to learn from each other, uh, to, to basically uh, get the tools right, uh, support the right set of policies, uh, not pretend to avoid them because they are basically coming anyway, but that this wave of regulation, this wave from the investors is clearly coming. Uh, but we need the industry associations at the national level, at the global level, uh, to be the platform for peer learning, for the platform for knowledge management, uh, the platform for providing strategic orientation to their members, uh, especially the ones that are not huge, but are big or medium or small, uh, that will not necessarily have a team in place to uh, come up with solutions for the many challenges that the that companies face, but actually will be looking at the associations for advice, guidance, and orientation. So uh, thank you for pointing on so many of the, of the elements that need to be there and, and the role for an associations like ICC UK and their brothers and sisters around the world, the other ones around the world uh, that play the same kind of role and fit in the same uh, position. So. Thanks again. Uh, I will go to our last uh, corporate uh, guest, um, in, um, which is Marcela Manuvens um, from Unilever, uh, social sustainability business strategist and special advisor to the board. Um, and I would like to ask you, Marcela, um, about embedding human rights across the business. Uh, you have been doing, and you have been quite, to, let's say, well, uh, um, recognized as a champion, as a leading company in this uh, push or this journey um, of, of embedding the guiding principles and the respect for human rights in business. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about the rationale for the different and pioneering approaches that you have been following, um, please? Thank you, Dante. Thank you, ICC, for hosting today and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, if you allow me, I would like to start very briefly by remembering and honor, honoring the formidable John Ruggie, who left us far too soon. We call him the godfather of the UNGP, so the Ruggie principles and framework. He was a role model, a mentor, a professor, a master collaborator, and consensus builder, and a dear friend to me. So I want to, to thank him for the contribution that he gave us. I know that he speaks on behalf of all of us. So uh, the idea of embedding human rights uh, was across the organization in all we do, goes along the, the comment that Moira has of the value chain. And it was the absolute foundation of the uh, social ambition and work we did at Unilever. This is the reason why we expanded the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan in 2014 to strengthen these elements and we created the three different pillars. 
And uh, the, the rationale was very simple. I mean, the question that we ask ourselves, and certainly I have, it has dominated my work, is how can we best ensure that we apply these principles and values at each business decision point? Not, not just in sourcing, not just, but if we are talking about taxation, if we are talking about consumer, if we are talking about every element and every corner of the business, how do we apply this? And that required that every individual in the organization knew the, the background, understood the principles and applied them in that business decision process. It was not about creating a program or creating a collection of initiatives, but a transformation, a business transformation. And, uh, you know, you, these, these considerations and these principles that were translated into a strategy and goals were then also included in each individual performance evaluation. And it was also linked to the, the um, different elements of that business unit or that impact in the organization. An example of what it shouldn't happen, you may know, and this, uh, this is, it happens very often, uh, that you may have a compliance program. I think that Moira was also referring and, and Tom about supply chain. So you may have a compliance program and the work is fantastic, but the person who is making the purchasing decisions in the organization many times are not using that information to make those decisions. So the work, I mean, if that happens in organizations is totally ineffective. That was not what we wanted to really focus on. We wanted to understand what was the impact that those decisions were having uh, throughout the organization. And uh, just finally, a comment is that was the reason because that cannot happen, that transformation cannot happen overnight that we created three distinctive phases on the work. The first phase was wiring the organization, making sure that we had the right strategy, the right goals that were spread out throughout the organization. The second phase was the effective implementation that I would like to refer later on. Uh, the knowledge and, uh, and capacity building and measuring you know, the impact that we have. And the third element was very simply moving you know, the whole ecosystem from do no harm to do good. I mean, we, when you look into the way that we construct much of the work, it's about doing no harm. Uh, it's about no child labor or no discrimination, et cetera. And we need to move all that to what good looks like, just you know, being able to drive the business uh, to that element. And it's a very, um, you know, I think that it has been referred to by Chris and, and by Crispin. We are in a very difficult business context right now. And, and to really be able to uh, operate in different, particularly for global companies, in different societies, in different um, uh, geopolitical systems is quite a complex element, but uh, we'll refer to that later, Dante. Thank you, Marcela. Uh, can, can you uh, dig in a little bit deeper in one of your flagship uh, uh, programs and announcements on living wage, uh, living income? Uh, because th this is one of the difficult conversations uh, that often does not take place, which is discuss about uh, fairness, justice, but in this case, salaries. Um, and, and of course, low salaries come with, let's say, uh, low prices for the, the goods and services, but actually does not guarantee an equitable society, a uh, peaceful society, an inclusive society. And therefore, you have been pushing this uh, lately, and I will, I will really like you to elaborate a little bit more in this flagship initiative that your company is, is pushing ahead. Okay, very good. So, the, you know, fairness, as you very well refer, has been uh, certainly since I came to Unilever, the first task that we had, Dante, was to make sure that we were, we ourselves, have in place the, the, the having place for living wages and that we were able to really drive 
this ambition within uh, our own uh, operations. So we accomplished that 2020, it was the first stage. And, uh, and, and now what Unilever will we launch early, early this year was our ambition has been to build a more equitable and inclusive society, raising living standards you know, across the value chain. And living wage is an enabler, right? Is for, for advancing the respect of human rights in many areas, not just you know, doing the right thing, but uh, it helps in health, in nutrition, in education, to just to mention a few of the enablers. And it helps business growth and economic development. One of the, one of the elements that I addressed while we were discussing internally living wage, that in general, when we talk about living wage and living income, the conversation focus on, on the cost, on the up cost to deploying a living wage strategy. But in doing so, it misses uh, certainly um, the, the larger business case for paying living wage. And in a paper that I put together some time uh, back, I mean, I the research based on governments and NGOs and many organizations across the world addresses several benefits for business. One is the benefit of a broader economic uh, economy by stimulating uh, consumer participation within the economy. And you can, um, the study that was conducted by Goldman Sachs some years back, it demonstrated that um, the, the, how, that, uh, how that economic model is put it in, in place. So it's about doing the right thing, stimulating the economy, and, and as I said, the impact on, on individuals. I mean, also higher, higher wages aid in job creation and help a small business, which has been addressed by you, Dante, early on. I mean, the research also demonstrate how that virtues um, you know, economic growth and, and cycle uh, plays out. It decreases uh, employee turnover, uh, reducing the cost of hiring and training workers, and motivates employees to work harder and improve job productivities. And, and, and there are many other elements that I can um, talk about. But it was interesting because one of the studies demonstrate that uh, during and after uh, COVID-19, I mean, these principles, you may remember that some of the companies, and I will remember some of them, I mean, declare the, the living wage or increase the wages for workers within the ranks to make sure that, um, you know, not only their business continue operating, but did so successfully. And uh, as a result of that, I mean, for, uh, subsequent studies demonstrate that really uh, help them to, to continue operating um, you know, in a way that um, stimulate um, the, the local, particularly the local economy. So uh, Unilever, you know, um, and for, for disclosure, I think that everybody knows I have been in Unilever for many years and decided to have a sabbatical and coming back as a special advisor for Unilever and focusing in other, uh, in other elements. But it's all really uh, very much linked in terms of what we want to do for human rights, the impact of living wage in other elements, I mean, this positive impact across multiple dimensions of human rights, as well as what it can do for business. And I think that financial, uh, the financial sector has a very important um, component or role to play to, to continue helping in this process of activation of the economy and supporting the business. Thank you very much, Marcela. Uh, now we'll get out of the three corporations invited to reflect and go uh, with uh, Samantha Rowe, partner of the uh, Bebois and Plimpton LLP, uh, to get, drive us through a, a vision from the angle of a legal advisory, a, advisory firm about uh, the future and the next 10 years to come, um, but also the risks for companies, the legal risks, regulatory litigation, soft law risks uh, that you see coming. We know that there's a wave coming, regulatory wave, practical wave, uh, investors wave regarding business and human rights. All that is of course very good in the eyes of our working group, my working group, uh, because that's what we wanted. But then what, what are the practical implications for real business? And, and we will appreciate uh, your reflection and your advice. So the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Dante, and thanks to the ICC for the invitation to join this panel today. Um, so perhaps let's start with where we are now in terms of existing legal risk, because it is here, it is real, and it is increasing. And Dante, you referred to the sort of three buckets, um, which are perhaps helpful to organise thinking around this. So there's regulatory risk, um, and, and a number of the panellists have already referred to this, Crispin in particular at the beginning, talked about the patchwork of mandatory measures that we're seeing across the globe, I would say, particularly in Europe. Um, examples will include modern slavery legislation. So we've got the UK and the Australian Modern Slavery Acts. We've got the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act. Tom referred to the Tariff Act in the US as well. We've got conflict minerals regulations and we've got coming in such as the Loi de Vigilance in France and the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act too. And at a fundamental level, what these laws are requiring is that companies that meet a certain size threshold investigate and report publicly on the steps that they're taking, or in some cases not taking, um, to investigate and address human rights impacts in their operations and their supply chains. And it's a patchwork in terms of both the geographical sense only some countries to date have introduced this type of regulation, but also in a subject matter sense as well. So, for example, the UK and Australia really focused on modern slavery. And as I said, other countries taking a much broader view. We're also seeing increasing litigation risk. This, frankly, at the moment is quite nascent. And the cases that we're seeing in particular in the UK, in Canada, in the US, in some European countries have really to date been kind of focused on when you can pull a company into court to answer for alleged adverse human rights impact often outside of the jurisdiction where the litigation is taking place. So a big focus has been in particular on when you can hold a parent company liable for the activities of their subsidiaries across the globe. Traditional concepts of corporate separateness would say that you can't do that. But of course, the UNGPs take a very different view and are premised upon the idea that companies are responsible for their entire operations, i.e. the entire corporate group, but also for third parties throughout their value chain. So we're seeing these sort of traditional legal doctrines being challenged by concepts that are coming out of the UNGPs. Um, there's also, as you said, Dante, this is what I would call a more sort of soft law risk. So, um, for example, we have national contact points that have been set up under the OECD guidelines not mandatory, they adopt a sort of mediation conciliation approach to complaints that are brought before them against multinational entities, but it can be extremely high profile, both the fact of the complaint itself and also the recommendations then that come out of the NCPs premised upon the OECD guidelines, but those track the UNGPs quite carefully. Um, and there are national human rights institutes as well across the world who have jurisdiction to investigate alleged adverse human rights impacts within their countries. Um, so where is this sort of all going? Um, I think the next big steps that we'll see in this area, we've talked already, Tom has already talked about um, the EU mandatory human rights due diligence directive. This, for a number of reasons, I think will be a bit of a, a game changer. Obviously it will apply throughout the EU, so in terms of geographical scope, that's a big deal already. Um, we haven't yet seen the Commission's draft. We've seen some proposals from the EU Parliament. And if those are picked up, the directive will apply to large companies, both private and public. It will also apply to some category of SMEs, um, listed SMEs, potentially also SMEs that are in high risk jurisdictions and high risk sectors. It will apply to some extent extraterritorially. So to companies that do business in the EU, so that will have a, a large extraterritorial impact as well. And in terms of what it aims to do, it will be one of these broad mandatory due diligence requirements. You will have to investigate, you will have to report publicly. There's also a possibility that that may be the creation of a private right of action for victims of adverse human rights impacts to be able to 
bring their cases um, to court within the EU, um, circumventing some of these sort of corporate separateness um, doctrines that I've talked about already. Um, we're also going to see some of these cases over the next 10 years actually work their way through to decisions on liability. And that will be extremely important because we don't really know yet in European courts, in English courts, in the US courts, in Canada, we don't know in what circumstances will a company be held liable for violations through its supply chain and what defences will be available to them. And this will be extremely important practically for companies to really start to think through actual legal risk. When will I be pulled into court, but also when ultimately will I be held liable and what will the courts find important in terms of being able to put up a defence to some of these claims um, presumably due diligence, actually taking steps to mitigate adverse human rights impacts will be extremely important, but that all remains to be seen as these cases work their way through the courts. And then in terms of what you can do to manage this on a very practical level, what advice are we giving to our clients? Um, Moira and Tom have already referred to this, but I think the importance of industry groups, of understanding evolving industry standards and best practices is incredibly important, especially while we're in this sort of no man's land period of moving from soft law to hard law. I think having a view on what the industry as a whole is doing is, is extremely important. Getting smart about your risk profile, very important. The same is not going to be demanded of all companies. It's going to depend on your size. It's going to depend on what geographies you're operating in. It's going to depend on your sector. It's going to depend on what the exposures are throughout your value chain. So really getting smart about that is, is extremely important. Um, undertaking a review of your existing governance structures, to what extent can those be leveraged? Companies already have a huge amount of processes, due diligence processes in place in relation to existing legal risk, like corruption, anti-bribery, anti-money laundering. Those can often be leveraged to incorporate this new developing risk in the sort of ESG sphere as well. And then I think having an eye, not just on where the law is right now, but on where it's going over the next five to 10 years is extremely important because upending what you're doing right now to cover existing legal risk is only going to last you for so long in this you know, rapidly evolving field. I think knowing where you're going is, is extremely important as you sort of prepare for the evolution of this risk in the years ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Samantha. And that actually sets the, the stage completely for Phil Bloomer from uh, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, uh, with, which is about the future. Uh, how the, the business and human rights uh, future looks like, what's the agenda about, and what can business do better um, and so the floor is yours, uh, Phil. Thanks very much, Dante, and thanks to the ICC for this opportunity. Um, I believe the future must look fundamentally different to the, pre to the present. If we're going to achieve a level of sustainability, both in terms of the climate breakdown that's upon us and in terms of the unsustainable levels of inequality, which now in uh, of power and wealth, that now inhabit our markets. So we need new business models. Even uh, Commissioner Reinders of the Euro European Commission has said we need new business models. And they're already to a degree under construction, and you've heard some of that today. They're under construction from the leading companies and indeed from leading investors, a few of whom are already on this panel with, with us. I think the last decade you know, has been far from the golden age of, of globalization. Since 2008, in the public mind, globalization has been associated with profound levels, growing levels of inequality, precarious employment, uh, low or stagnant wages, increasing levels of climate breakdown and environmental uh, destruction, rootless capital, and systematic tax avoidance on the part of multinational companies and the rich. And so there's a degree of, in, there's an enormous level of distrust that's grown up. Uh, through that, and we've seen that now is that in the rise of authoritarianism and in anti-democratic forces. And I think what we've just heard from uh, the panelists has been what is now the trend of governments to say, 
we have to be able to, as, as our electorate has, des, is in, has been deserting us, we have to assert how we as politicians and as states can deliver a future of shared prosperity and shared security. And so part of that agenda, only part of it, but a key, key part of it is how do we construct the right forms of business regulation and business incentives, as well as the norms that are arising from the leaders, the, the, the corporate leaders and the investor leaders, that will allow us to direct markets that will deliver that shared prosperity and shared security. So there's essentially what we're seeing is this extraordinary sea change and the sea change that's now expressed, I think, as, a, as, the, as the spear point in terms of the mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. And that, I think, is also something for us to reflect on in the sense that the, the mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence, first of all, expresses the coming together of human rights and environment. It is shocking, to be honest, in a pleasing way that the European Commission saw fit to bring those two items together, which have previously been seen as entirely separate. The second part of that due diligence model is that it's essentially saying that the voluntarist approach has worked wonderfully for some of the leading companies, but it is not driving the scale, the systematic change that we need in markets. And therefore, the kind of approach that the UK government has taken in terms of the Modern Slavery Act, which was a kind of nudge politics, you know, please report, we insist you provide some kind of information about what you're doing about modern slavery, but you can just say that we're doing nothing and that will be, that will be adequate. That no longer is acceptable. Companies are being expected, as others have said, to reach down into their operations and through into their supply chains to identify the salient risks that that company faces in terms of the damage and harm that they can do to the environment and to people, and to then take mitigating action to minimize or eliminate those, those risks, which are avoidable. And so I think that is the, that's what's gonna be, we're gonna be seeing oh, in the future over the next 10 years. It's going to be expressed in many different ways. We are doing workshops, for instance, across Latin America and many emerging economies where states, as well as investors, companies and civil society are coming together to think about how these kind of approaches and principles can be applied, not by simply taking the European legislation, whatever it ends up as, off the shelf, but adapting it to the, the, those, those different circumstances. But seeing that if that effort to identify the risks to mitigate those risks. Because I think you know, Dante, you know, we take up over a thousand allegations of abuse a year as the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre. A thousand allegations of abuse, and it's only the tip of the iceberg, but from grassroots organisations, from grassroots communities who see whether it's in transition minerals of lithium and cobalt, or whether it's in fossil fuels, or whether it's in unpaid wages because of what happened in the pandemic by fast fashion brands, or indeed in food and beverage. Um, we see the way in which land is being taken, water is being taken away from communities, away from uh, uh, and, uh, and the way in which workers are not being paid. Therefore, that opportunity that Unilever just described, Marcella just described, in terms of building the living wage and demonstrating it's not just a moral imperative, it's also commercially viable to pay a living wage. That's the kind of efforts that we're going to see, which also then emboldens politicians to say, well, hang on, if these companies can do it, why can't everybody else at least meet those minimum, minimum standards of human rights? Because a living wage is written into the United Nations as a human right. So I think it's in that way that we're going to see this, uh, these broad changes. Bill, <coughs> sorry, can you elaborate a little bit more on the just recovery out of the pandemic? Because how is this uh, past year and a half informing what you're describing in terms of the challenges ahead of us? Yeah, so I mean, firstly, you know, the pan, the reaction of business to the pandemic was mixed, but a lot of it was very bad in the sense that the response of business and indeed of investors was to simply pass down the costs and the risks 
down that supply chain, whether it was a apparel in unpaid wages, using force majeure uh, uh, clauses in contracts to say, we're not paying for anything. I know you've manufactured the clothes and I know they're on a container coming over the, uh, uh, coming up the Atlantic Ocean, but we're not paying for them because we're going to use the force majeure because we don't need them anymore. That meant that the workers who had manufactured those clothes didn't get paid. Women workers in Bangladesh, in, in, in Cambodia. So now, but then there was a re reaction coming out of that, of the pandemic that said, hang on, we have really disrupted our supply chains. We've got gr far greater vulnerability in our supply chains than we, than we perhaps thought. And therefore there's now a shift to starting to look at how do we prevent unnecessary shocks and how do we build the resilience to cope with the shocks that we cannot avoid? And some of that is inevitably better treatment of suppliers, longer term, uh, longer term contracts with suppliers, and in the end, because of that, better treatment of workers and communities. So that's starting to play out. There's still a long, long way to go. We're still you know, talking to a lot of brands about unpaid wages of workers from a year ago. So it's not as if we're entering a, 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 new, a, a new utopia, <laughs> but there are, elements in there from the leaders, leading companies and investors that are, that are demonstrating what's going to be possible. And I think the other thing that's happening is, obviously, that pandemic has meant that, first of all, many people who have been extraordinarily low paid are now seen as essential workers. And therefore, systematic abuse of care workers or, or, or delivery workers, for instance, is no longer tolerable or is far less tolerable. And that's why you've got, for instance, some of these cases that uh, Samantha spoke about, where, for instance, gig workers who are challenging their misclassification as self-employed are now being heard by the courts. And as we know, the UK Supreme Court just said that essentially it doesn't matter what scale of fic fictional contracts might be created by platforms, it's, there's still a worker-employee employer relationship there. So it's mm. these things that are coming through, I think, from the, from the pandemic that's important. The other one, of course, is that most that more, more governments are actually seeing the need for responsible regulation and responsible business and reorientation of business incentives. So obviously the due diligence, but now also the emphasis on workers' rights, on living wage, on the European green taxonomy that's got, and now the social taxonomy that will define what is includable in this ESG fiction, unfortunately, that's there with so much greenwashing that really undermines the great uh, funds that there are ESG funds. But if the majority of it is simply repackaging the old development, the old uh, investment models, it's not good enough. And it, crucially, I'd just add, if I may, the work in the OECD, including by Janet Yellen, you know, for the, a global agreement on a floor on corporate taxation. These are all coming together, I think, and that's going to be the future. And some of that has been provoked by the pandemic, by states who realise they've got to start not only being assertive in, in regulatory and incentives action, but also making sure that they're gaining what is necessary for the state to function, to build the infrastructure that's going to be necessary for the just transition to, uh, to, uh, to, to clean energy and a brighter future in terms of climate change. Thank you, Bill, Phil. And uh, we will move into a, a second and last round of interventions. We only have two, three minutes for each one of you to make an intervention. So I will, I will caution on, on the timing because we're really running out of time. So I will kick a, a, a question for each one of you but also, if you want to react to something that someone else has said, of course, this is your opportunity. And I would like to ask you for the last 30 seconds to reflect on the future, how the future should look like. Some of you have already uh, mentioned it al uh, already, so you don't have to repeat yourself. But if you want uh, to use the final 30 seconds to actually uh, look forward, that will be really, really good. Uh, so a question for Moira is about embedding is about normalizing human rights due diligence and respect for human rights in a, a, a company like yours. So how you do that, uh, embedding the existing uh, policies and processes, and how you change the culture of a company 
to consider business and human rights part of its normal and not something special or pioneer of a pioneer nature. So the floor is yours, Moya. Thank you. Well, um, some of the uh, excellent speakers already have touched on, on some of these areas. I, I, in, in particular, you know, Samantha, I think, was mentioning that companies will have existing processes to address a number of other risks um, that an organisation may, may have. And um, I would say, let's not reinvent reinvent the wheel here where where you can you use them whether it's you know anti-bribery processes or your supply chain due diligence use the existing tools that you already have to add in if it's not already there um, respect for human rights i think you know it is sometimes um requires slightly different mindset because as we all know enterprise risk management tends to think about risks to the organization whereas human rights due diligence requires us to think about risks to people. Now, often these do come together in the end, um, but it's important that people understand that difference when they are working with um, those existing processes or, or um, using them to include and embed human rights. Um, to get to that point, Marcella was talking about the importance of culture and the importance of internal engagement. And I think you know, it could be done through formal training, for example, it, you know, like Vodafone has training on human rights specific to particular areas so that people really understand how it impacts their particular area of work. But having those broad conversations and setting, setting yourself up structurally um, so that, you know, for example, um, Vodafone has a human rights advisory group, which comprises people from very, you know, varying departments, whether it's legal, security, procurement, diversity, so that you're all having that conversation together and you can ensure that it the conversation is happening in different parts of your business. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll pause that. Okay, thank you, uh, Moira. Uh, Tom, um, regarding uh, Walmart, um, what are your main uh, challenges looking ahead? And I would like to uh, signal one that is, uh, in your case, of obvious uh, priority, which is your supply chain. Um, how do you think about the supply chain of the, of the current uh, reality, but also the future? and how you're dealing with business human rights in your own supply chain, which is vast. Yeah, thanks, Dante. Yeah, big big question. I'll try and keep this one uh, kind of keep this one short. And I think just, as you say, playing on some of the other points uh, that were raised, I think the, the context of how, how we've taken our journey as well, so it kind of brings you through to that, that, that question of how we're looking at it at the moment, is I think it's the kind of historic understanding the journey that we've gone through to get to where we are right now. And I think um it's we're about 59 years old now i think it was and i, and I think we we've reflected that as companies have grown uh, you know as we've grown as people grow the kind of mindsets and perspectives change and i think there's a lot to be learned in how we've evolved our journey for how other companies are looking at how they need to look at things because i think when we um you know a while back you know we were a big company and kind of didn't hadn't fully understood what it was meant or what was required of us socially and environmentally um, and we were, like many companies are today, small startups were very focused on customers, associates and growth. We were doing some charitable giving. We kind of generally, I think there's always an admission we thought they were doing good by serving others, but appreciated that there was that massive disconnect with how we saw ourselves versus how others view us. And I think, again, like many companies are going through today, some see this as a communications problem. We kind of talked about it earlier, like, OK, you know, just kind of repackage what we're doing. But I don't, I think we realized that wasn't, it wasn't just as simple as that. So it's kind of not about um, kind of repackaging what you're doing already, but about understanding what you're not doing. And I think that that was kind of quite a critical piece in the journey that kind of Walmart's gone through. And so kind of where we are now and answering that, that point, Dante, I think it's, uh, you know, this shared value whole systems approach to kind of a social and environmental piece, this big kind of big package of back to Phil's point about how the EU's kind of combine these two, because I think you have to see them as, as a collective piece. Um, I think it's not just about uh, kind of operating responsibly and mitigating, you know, a risk, but actually how you create value in the supply chains and kind of try and tackle some of these social and environmental issues. So the context kind of brings us forward to 2018 when our first uh, human rights report was released. And then now um, uh, we kind of release our ESG report annually. And so my, my, my suggestion is have a look at what 
is on that we released the ESG report a couple of months ago. There's some summaries out there because we try and push out as much information as we possibly can on how we do these things to kind of really encourage everybody to kind of look at it. And all of these, again, back to some of the early points, all of these policies are informed by uh, international instruments, um, you know, like the UN guiding principles uh, and, and, and the rest. But I think um, specific to your point, Dante, and again, all of this is online. A lot of people kind of miss that, I think, sometimes in, in our world. But we look at it, we look at our salient human rights risks and priorities, because obviously we've got this, as you said, vast supply chain, buying products everywhere from everyone. You know, we have to look at where we where we want to prioritize. So we look at it relevance to our company purpose, key categories, key markets, the, the scale and severity of the products, human potential human rights risks. And I think this is critical because our ability to make a difference as well. Um, you know, so we put all of these things through these lenses and we prioritize specific supply chains that we feel that we can make the biggest impact on kind of in, protect, in promoting human rights risks. All of these are online as well. So you've got Paran in Bangladesh, produce in Mexico, uh, shrimp in Thailand, I'm going to miss someone here, tuna Thailand, and electronics for the US market. So we go through this process, this is all online, um, and really, you know, encourage people to look on it and, and, and provide feedback. But yeah, Dante, I mean, I think, needless to say, it's, it's a moving, moving thing as well. What's happened the past year has flipped and changed a lot of these uh, supply chain risks. As Phil pointed out, last year was a huge amount of dedication just looking at this huge problem of order cancellations and how we can try and mitigate that, how we can support our suppliers from small, you know, from small SME suppliers to massive, huge suppliers. So I think, you know, I think it's that ability to really be able to be flexible to this changing environment. I mean, what hit us in the supply chain over the past couple of years was to some extent, you know, to some extent unprecedented. So um, lots of things in there. I think I answered your question, Dante, but let me know if I missed anything. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, to, um, to Marcella from Unilever. Um, as we stand today, uh, what are the challenges for business to advance the human rights agenda in an effective, impactful manner? Uh, what can be done better? Mm -hmm. So, so much to talk and react, uh, Dante. Thank you to my uh, panelists. And in, uh, and in three minutes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So let me do two or three issues more than uh, focusing on what are the challenges, what we can do. Point number one, effective implementation. I believe we are very long on, on goals and frameworks and we are short in delivery and action. And I'm not just referring to, to business, I'm referring to all the stakeholders, business, government, civil society, human rights due diligence is everybody's job. It's not just an agenda for business. We are all on this together. And if you look into the last two or three years, you're gonna see crisis in every single one of those elements and without referring more to that. So point number one, you know, we need to get the job done and stop talking and creating more things by getting what we have already done. Point number two, it has to be an integrated approach. You know, sustainability is a tripod. It's environmental, social, and economic aspects and governance, of course, uh, is, is the pillar to, help us deliver that. But historically, and still today, they compete with each other, right? I mean, and the trade-offs that, that I hear in the discussions are quite concerning. Should I do more environmental, but less social? And I'll give you one concrete example. During the last three, four years, four years, everybody has been very concerned about plastic. Plastic, no less plastic, no plastic, no waste, less waste. And, uh, and from the very beginning, I was concerned that we were going to address that and we were going to forget about the social components of that agenda. And sure enough, many of the innovations that the experts are bringing are uh, sort of delivered with workers at the bottom of those supply chains with poverty wages. So we are creating the next generation of problems, right? So by the solutions that we have right now, by not looking at it 100%, I mean, comprehensively, we are creating the next generation of problems. And that example is transportation, and you are in Europe, most of you. I mean, what it happened with transportation during and after COVID, and the results, what is happening right now. Um, um, another element that I want to, to, to mention is this uh, unnecessary focus on conflict prevention and resolution, on having, 
you know, rebuilding together means working in coalitions in an effective manner. And this that I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm gonna show you this division of the world of 50% supporting and 50% trying to demolish what it has been created is not helping for anyone. Um, I think that Phil uh, mentioned that the next 10 years, in my opinion, will be very different of what we did before. I'm certainly concerned with the current PR movement, whether certainly for, uh, for brands making statements that cannot be delivered. It impacts everyone when a brand or a company cannot deliver in what they have committed to because it erodes trust in business. I strongly recommend for business to be realistic in setting the goals and priorities and restrain the urge to say everything and over promise. And uh, final, last but not least, reacting to a comment of, of Phil. I mean, we, uh, he gave the example of the UK Modern Slavery Act. I mean, one of the brilliant elements of Kevin Highland was to open the dialogue so companies and others could report. We need to be careful with the mandatory due diligence, which we, I certainly fully support, will bring clarity, but uh, from many elements and will uh, create a level playing field. The problem that we have is to not create an absolute vacuum of, of really uh, the discussion and disclosures and, and solutions. Um, because I think that Samantha, you talk about uh, liabilities. If we all go around liabilities, then we are not gonna get the job done. And that's the last point I want to make, Dante. Thank you very much, Marcela. And now we will actually run or jump into Samantha's uh, uh, comments. And uh, in the advice you're giving to your clients, you already mentioned this a little bit about being smart and understanding your risk environment and how it evolves. But uh, can you get us um, a little bit more into that? Uh, what does it mean to be smart? Um, does it mean disinvesting, the, the risking, or engaging and using leverage? Um, and uh, how are you suggesting companies to adapt their current systems, policies, and procedures to a new normal that is not the current normal? And, uh, and how to keep an eye into the future, uh, how to prepare for the next decade. So uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dante. Well, look, on your first question, I think the UNGPs provide a very clear answer to that, which is um, that when you are looking at a situation where you are potentially causing or contributing to an adverse human rights impact, um, the sort of knee-jerk reaction of, well, let's just pull out isn't always going to be the right reaction because you have to consider the human rights impacts of that very decision. And as you say, the UNGPs make reference to leverage and the ability to exercise that. So it is a more nuanced exercise than just pulling out of something. And there's a particular concern in the environmental field at, at the moment, the climate change field, that if um, public companies are sort of pulling out of assets and perhaps private capital is moving in to take their place, that that actually is unhelpful because it gives the rest of us less visibility, less transparency into the transition measures that are being undertaken and making sure that we're ending up moving towards the net zero goal and not away from it. So it's, it's a, a complex nuanced area and that frankly is the bottom line message to clients as well. I think Moira made an, an excellent point earlier about this being a reorientation of how you think about impacts. It's no longer just value for shareholders. It's no longer financial bottom line. That is still part of it for sure. And when you're talking about legal risk and reputational risk, you know, bottom line does obviously form an important part of that. But if you're not reorienting to think more about the external impacts of your operations and the external impacts of your supply chain, you're not going in the direction that you need to be going in. Um, and in terms of what you can sort of do to think about managing that risk, I mean, I think it's having a good hard look at your internal policies, your processes, the contracts that you have in place with your supply chain. Uh, do you have sufficient information rights, for example, to be able to satisfy yourself that you've conducted sufficient due diligence? Um, are you contracting with third parties who you can 
trust to undertake sufficient due diligence and who you can then rely on in terms of pulling information up through the value chain. Um, so it's it's really sort of thinking about all of these things and that I think is this is the way forward in terms of managing risk as we move forward towards more and more mandatory hard law in this area. Thank you, Samantha. In the last uh, three minutes uh, to uh, Phil Bloomer, um, you have learned, you have listened to our corporate uh, panelist and also the legal advisor. So there, there was a question for you around climate change. You might still want to take it on board and the connection with the business and human rights agenda, but maybe your final reflection can be reflecting on what uh, the our, our panelists have said already and looking into the future, what are the greatest challenges that you see? And with you, we will be wrapping up this session. Thank you, Phil. Thanks. And first of all, you know, it's it's inspiring to hear uh, voices as we've heard on this panel, for me at least uh, today. I think what we're seeing is, you know, the, the, the shifts that we've heard today in terms of the way some of these leading companies are, uh, are approaching the future is about a shift from this free market fetishism, which we've had over the last 40 years, for maximizing the short term return on investors to investors and a shift to actually building longer term value for the company and therefore through this, the, the value chain of that company. And the mandatory human rights due diligence, the efforts of the Tariff Act, et cetera, the green taxonomy, social, all these are, are efforts to start to reorientate markets towards building longer term value and therefore greater resilience and therefore less vulnerability to the shocks that are going to come down upon us all uh, shortly. And they're already there as we've seen with the pandemic. So from my perspective, there is one other area that I'd also like to do. And, and just to say on that, you know, the kind of efforts that have been made on transparency, for instance, what Tom spoke about in terms of the tra transparency and traceability, the, Oh, openness about supply chains is, is fundamental to that. Accountability is, is fundamental to that. In terms of companies being prepared to identify where they're not only a risk, but where damage and harm has been done, and there's going to be redress for communities. And where we are building the kind of living wage environment for workers and the free prior and informed consent for communities, that are fundamentally part of the uh, delivery of, of John Ruggie's legacy in terms of the, um, the UN guiding principles. I just wanna finish though by saying for every company, the access to energy is fundamental to their work. And we are seeing, first of all, a massive risk in terms of the closing down of fossil fuel industries, which has to happen extremely quickly because lots of people could easily be thrown out of work and onto the scrap heap with all the implications that we've seen with Brexit and Trump, et cetera, in the UK and the US and elsewhere. But also we've got this enormous challenges of opening up clean energy. And that is unfortunately, clean energy is, 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 is we are seeing the fastest rising numbers of allegations coming from uh, clean energy. It's still nowhere near the allegations for fossil fuels, but it's the fastest rising. And so we need to get hold of that. And all the companies which are accessing energy need to think about that supply chain as well to make sure that we are not dispossessing indigenous people and, and providing work that is not decent to workers. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. You're mentioning the circling of the square or the other way around depends on the context, but it is certainly because my, my, my country is living exactly that in the energy transition. We produce lithium, let's say, and sun, so uh, and, and a lot of it. Okay, so we have come to an end with this uh, session. So thank you very much for all the panelists and from ICC UK and ICC Global for the invitation. So we have come to, to an end, as I just said. Thank you very much for your uh, open uh, openness to share. And I will give back the floor to, to Chris for, let's say, coming to, to a close. But from my end, thank you very much again for the invitation. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dante, and to all our speakers. What a fantastic session. Um, this is uh, so relevant to so many conversations that we have across the ICC network.
So, you know, in terms of takeaways, I, I was busy jossing down. And I think, you know, what I'm taking away from here is one, we need collective action. That's a theme running through the week. Uh, in this particular space, sea change is coming with mandatory laws, regulations, and the ESG agenda driving, particularly through investors. Uh, but actually, on the positive side, there's a real opportunity to understand better from 10 years experience uh, and an opportunity to design better quality policies going forward to tackle um, some of the inequalities and issues that we've seen over the last 10 years. Uh, and to the point that Marcella was making, the need for effective implementation. And that, again, is a theme that's running through the week on every single area of the agenda. So what a massive thank you to our speakers. A special thanks to Deborah Boz and Plimpton for sponsoring this session and our wider conference sponsors. Uh, without you, we wouldn't have been able to put this on at all. Um, if any of you have missed any of the sessions, don't worry. Uh, they're all available for seven days to watch on demand. Uh, so just get in touch if you need to uh, access any of that and are struggling. Um, and look forward to the next session, uh, which will be on enabling SMEs to access trade finance. And uh, you can register for that on the event platform. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you.